Starting from this chapter, we'll dig a bit deeper and we'll explore more about each of them. We will start with equity capital markets, the process of raising equity capital through an IPO or a public equity offering. Why would a company want to go public? Well, there are a number of reasons to do that. A company could be tempted to go public in order to finance its current growth. A growing business needs a significant amount of financial resources, and an IPO could be a great way to attract fresh capital into the firm. In addition, when a company lists its shares on the stock exchange, it receives a market value for each of them, right? It would be easy to value the entire firm once investors start trading its shares. Therefore, theoretically, the company would be able to buy other companies with its stock. It can offer some of its shares to the shareholders of a smaller company, who will easily have an idea of how much they are offered, given that these shares are already priced on the market. Listed companies are preferred partners for many businesses out there. A listing on the stock exchange brings reputation and visibility. Being a listed firm means critical dimensions, crystal clear financial reporting, and a vote of confidence by large investors. Nowadays, a lot of managers receive stock as a part of their annual compensation. This is a mechanism that is designed in order to align management and shareholders' goals. Public companies use this tool in order to incentivize their top managers and stimulate them to run a profitable company that preserves value in the long run. Lastly, IPOs are often considered as an exit opportunity for the founders of the business. They've worked hard and want to make some money. The business is ready to be sold to bigger investors, who will fuel its growth and will ensure that it reaches a maturity stage. In most cases, the founders of a company are more than willing to sell a large portion of the shares that they own. It is quite important to mention that this is the moment when they will lose control and stop being the key decision maker within the business. It is natural for entrepreneurs to make this big payday in case their firm gets listed. After all, most studies show that only one out of ten startups succeeds. In our next lesson, we will talk about the investors in an IPO. Who are they? What type of companies are they interested in? And what is their investment horizon? The investors in an IPO can be grouped into three main categories. Retail investors, institutional investors, and hedge funds. Retail investors are private individuals looking to invest their money in order to diversify their income and earn more money. Typically, these investors can invest lower amounts and are subject to significant transaction costs due to fees of brokerage and high bid-ask spreads. Institutional investors are entities like mutual and pension funds and insurance companies. These organizations have the resources and specialized knowledge for extensively researching a variety of investment options that are unavailable for retail investors. Some institutional investors have a very solid reputation. Attracting BlackRock and Fidelity's interest in an IPO can be a very strong signal for the market. Hedge funds, on the other hand, are investment vehicles who are mainly interested in trading with underpriced or overpriced securities. Their investment horizon is extremely short, given that they are interested in making an educated bet, profiting, and then closing their position. The three types of investors differ significantly in terms of investment horizon, return expectations, risk profile, and sophistication. Right, so these are the three types of investors. What are they looking for in an IPO? All investors want to buy the shares of a strong company. A company that has market leadership, strong management, a solid financial position, and a very high level of visibility and disclosure. In addition, investors don't want to be stuck with a given investment. They'll need liquidity in terms of a secondary market, where they will be able to sell their shares if necessary. Finally, investors want an interesting valuation.
a valuation at a discount, which provides an incentive to place orders and assume the risk of buying a security that hasn't been traded before. Is there a type of investor that is preferred by investment bankers? Well, of course there is. Investment bankers like retail and institutional investors. In fact, almost always they try to allocate some shares to retail investors because retail demand creates momentum in the book building process. Retail investors are the ones who typically hold a stock the longest, which is something very valuable. It is a banker's goal to find investors who will stick with the company. On the other hand, hedge funds will be the ones who will dump the stock as soon as they can. Investment bankers' recommendation will depend heavily on the type of investors that will come on board at a certain price level. They aim to achieve the company's objectives and ensure a stable aftermarket. Of the process, the topic of pricing becomes more and more important. The company's ownership becomes anxious. Investment bankers organize meetings with potential investors who express their intentions. Top management delivers presentations and explains what lies ahead of the company. All of this is done in an effort to determine the price that investors are willing to pay on the day of the IPO. In this lesson, we will talk about the various price-setting mechanisms. The price range which is set for an IPO depends on multiple factors. Its key goal is to provide a slight discount to the actual trading value of the company. This will keep investors happy and facilitate the post-launch trading of the shares. So, which are the main ways that are used to determine how much the company's shares are worth? Discounted cash flow valuation is the main technique that is applied in order to determine a company's price. It consists in calculating the present value of all cash flows that the company is going to deliver to its owners. The basis for this valuation are historical results and the business plan that has been prepared by the management team of the company. So, the DCF model establishes a possible price range. But what other factors play a role? Another valuation technique that is applied by practitioners and triangulates results is multiples valuation, consisting in finding comparable companies having a similar business in terms of industry, size, geography, and market strategy. Analysts use the price of these public companies and calculate a ratio between their prices and operating results. This ratio can be multiplied by the firm's operating result and thus obtain a sense of the company's valuation. As anticipated, we'll cover these techniques later in the course. It is easy to imagine why the shape of the general economic environment can be of extreme importance. Nobody wants to conduct an IPO when financial markets are turbulent and all shares are going down. Tens of IPOs were cancelled in 2008 when the global financial crisis erupted. Towards the end of the IPO process, investment bankers' idea of pricing improves significantly. After each meeting with investors, they receive feedback about investors' willingness to buy shares at different price points. So institutional investors are able to tell the bank how many of the IPO'd shares they are willing to buy at different prices. This process is called book building. At the end of all roadshows, investment bankers have a very good idea of how many shares can be sold at different price points and suggest a price to the owners of the IPO'd company that is based on this information. We need to remember a few important facts. Ideal pricing is at a reasonable discount to trading value of the company. Book of demand is the most important tool in discussing pricing. Limits from anchor orders and from investors that have been heavily involved in the process are a very important signal for the optimal price. Pricing is a long and difficult discussion with the company and its shareholders. As a conclusion, we can repeat the following. Pricing should achieve the company's objectives whilst assuring a stable aftermarket.
take an in-depth look at the various steps that are necessary in order to carry out an initial public offering. These steps can be divided in two phases, pre-launch and execution. Naturally, we'll start by describing the various pre-launch steps. Let's imagine that the IPO process starts six months before the intended date of the offering. The first task that the company's ownership have is to hire advisors. Besides investment bankers, they'll need the help of legal, industry, tax, and financial advisors who will carry out a due diligence of the firm. They'll create documents describing the company's as-is situation. In 90% of the cases, companies have a pre-existing relationship with the investment bank that they hire. In an ideal world, bankers have been the firm's trusted advisors for a long time and have helped the company grow its business and go public, have given a signal that the time for an IPO has come. So, once all advisors have been hired, they will define the key issues that have to be addressed by the firm. Are there any legal problems that have to be addressed before going public? Is there a particular topic that is likely to concern investors? How solid is the company's financial reporting system? Is everything coherent with IFRS or USGAAP? These are some of the topics that come out when advisors carry out their due diligence. At this moment, investment bankers work closely with the company's management team and prepare their first valuations using the techniques that we described earlier. The prospectus is one of the critical documents in an IPO. Typically, it is very heavy and exhaustive, describing almost all aspects of a company's business. This is done in an effort to protect retail investors. They are less sophisticated than professional investors and need access to a descriptive document that enables them to make an informed decision. The final version of the prospectus should be ready in approximately two to three months before the company's listing on the stock exchange. The next few processes are a part of the execution phase of the IPO. One or two months before the IPO, investment bankers and top management start their roadshow, meeting with investors, answering their questions, and trying to win the support of key investors, like industry experts, reputable funds such as BlackRock and Fidelity, and retail investors. At the end of each of these roadshow meetings, investment bankers ask investors for feedback regarding their interest and the price they are willing to pay for the company's shares. Once the roadshow and book-building processes have been completed, bankers gain an idea of how many shares and at what price they will be able to sell to investors. They advise the company's ownership on how to allocate shares between the various types of investors. The main goal here is to get quality investors on board. Investors who will stick with the company after the IPO and will thus support the price of the shares that are listed on the stock exchange. And finally, the last stage of the process is the actual listing of the company's shares and the start of their trading on the stock exchange. These are the typical steps that we have in an IPO. In our next lesson, we will learn that, in reality, there is a syndicate of investment bankers that work on an IPO. Every IPO process involves a plurality of investment banks working on it. Why is this necessary? Isn't it sufficient to work with a single investment bank? Well, if we have to answer this question directly, no, it is not sufficient to work with a single investment bank. There are a number of reasons for that. The most obvious reason is that certain investors prefer working with certain investment banks. The more banks that participate in the so-called syndicate, the bigger the chances of attracting important investors. At the same time, the syndicate has a clear hierarchical structure. At the top, we will have one or two banks who will assume the role of global coordinators. Their role would be to oversee the entire process and co-coordinate the various work streams. Next, we have the role of the book runners. Again, there can be one, two, or three banks who will be book runners. Oftentimes, global coordinators are also active as book runners in the IPO offering. Book runners are responsible for the entire marketing effort. 
the care of analyst presentations, roadshow presentations, and are the ones who manage the whole banking syndicate. Lastly, the banks which are hired as co-lead managers help with the marketing efforts of the transactions and contribute with their networking and know-how expertise. So, these are the three types of roles that investment banks can have in a syndicate. The more important the role of a bank, the more fees it'll be able to earn in an IPO. Let's dig a bit deeper into the IPO pricing process, shall we? We listed the factors that determine the price range. But still, I would like to provide a few additional technical details that will hopefully give a clear picture. So, in our IPO timeline, we said that the investment bank responsible for the IPO drafts a prospectus. However, we didn't mention that before doing that, they issue a pre-IPO research report. This is a document that comes with the announcement of the IPO to the public and contains a preliminary assessment of the company's business carried out by the investment bank's analysts. Actually, this is the last report the investment bank carrying out the IPO provides about the issuer up until closing of the offering. The idea is to prohibit boosting up the company's profile in front of the public in the period that is close to the actual initial public offering. Okay, so once the research report goes out, it is circulated to retail and institutional investors, and the investment bank responsible for the IPO starts its pre-marketing efforts. This typically consists of contacting institutional investors to learn more about their feelings towards the equity story of the company to be listed. This allows bankers to determine a suitable price range, which, depending on the situation, can be 10 or 20% wide. Once an initial price range has been established, it is time for the roadshow. Investment bankers organize one-on-one -on -one and group meetings with investors interested in the IPO. This helps them get a better idea about a possible price range. The demand for the stock evolves throughout the roadshow. And book building is significantly influenced by the number of shares institutional investors are willing to buy at a given price. At the same time, when retail investors place an order, they can only indicate the maximum price at which they are willing to buy the company's shares. They can't declare interest in buying different amounts of shares at various price points. This is one of the reasons why investment bankers like retail investors. They are price insensitive. When an IPO manages to attract the attention of retail investors, this creates a very strong momentum in the book-building process. Institutional investors understand that investment bankers prefer allocating shares to retail investors because they will likely hold the shares in the long run and sustain the stock price in the days after the IPO. The typical roadshow is an intense period where tens of meetings are organized and investment bankers, along with management, travel across several locations to make themselves available. One may think that it is best to organize one meeting in every location to save time and provide evidence that there is strong interest in the IPO. However, this is not necessarily true, considering the risk of receiving a truly challenging question from an investor and having all other investors hear that question. That is why the roadshow is a combination of one-on-one -on -one and group presentations. When investment bankers and the firm have decided on a maximum IPO price, then the retail offering begins. Somewhere during that time, the book-building process ends, and investment bankers, the company's management, and ownership have a final meeting to determine the final price of the IPO. During that discussion, all factors mentioned earlier are taken into consideration.
DCF valuation, trading of comparable companies, market sentiment, ownership goals, all of which are important. However, the most important indicator of a suitable IPO price is the book of demand. The company ownership and investment bankers gather together for a meeting. It is this meeting that determines the price of the shares to be listed and their allocation to investors. Every investor is willing to buy a certain number of shares at a given price point. Here's a chart that gives you an idea of investors' demand at different price points. Some investors are willing to buy more shares at $13, fewer at $14. Demand at $15 is slightly thinner than that, and so forth. One would think that this is a no-brainer. Shareholders and bankers should choose the highest price point, which allows the sale of the targeted number of shares, right? Not necessarily. A number of factors come into consideration. And this isn't always easy to explain to ownership who have no previous experience in the process. So, first of all, it is important that investors wouldn't be left with a sour taste after the IPO. In order to do that, the company will have to sell the stock at a slight discount, allowing investors to profit in the first few hours of trading. In addition, a slight discount increases the number of investors who are willing to buy the company's shares, which provides some extra liquidity in the market. Liquidity is helpful, as it helps stabilize the stock price in the period after listing. It is very important to try to allocate as many shares as possible to investors who believe in the equity story and are buying with a long-term perspective. The obvious criteria for allocation are the price limit and quantity of shares desired by a given investor. Also, it is important the timing of the investor's order. Did they submit an order at the beginning of the book-building process? Or at the very end, when there was already momentum for the stock? Bankers take into consideration how involved a given investor was in the IPO whether they asked reasonable questions, and the chemistry with company management during one-on-one -on -one meetings. Another very important factor is an investor's previous IPO track record. How did they behave? Did they hold the stock in the long run? Did they purchase the amount of stock indicated in the book-building process? So, these are some of the criteria investment banks consider when discussing the allocation of shares to investors. However, there are a few additional ones as well. Sometimes it is evident if an investor has put in the necessary amount of work to understand the company. Also, they could have very useful insensible concerns and future perspectives. So, there are a number of factors influencing the execution of an IPO. We can recap by saying that bankers usually prefer to get on board the following types of investors. Retail. Institutional investors with a long-term horizon. The ones who placed their orders earlier in the book-building process. Investors who understand the company and have done the necessary due diligence and have expressed interest during meetings and presentations. And, of course, investors who have proven that they are reliable and have a solid IPO participation track record. So, yes, this isn't a process that is entirely driven by the stock price. We shouldn't forget, though, that the leading bank proposes an allocation and then it is up to the company ownership to decide on an allocation. In the next two lessons, we'll talk about an important technique investment banks implement during the first several days when a company gets listed on the stock market. It is called stabilization, and basically ensures the company's price will remain stable 
in the immediate period after the IPO. However, to be able to explain stabilization, green shoe, and over allotment, we'll need an introductory lesson. If you are already familiar with what it means to take a short or a long position, feel free to go ahead and take a look at the next video. All right. A short position describes the attitude of an investor towards a particular financial instrument. Let's say the shares of a company. So, if we say that an investor has taken a short position with respect to, to a given stock, this means that she expects the stock to decrease in the short term. And given that the investor is interested in maximizing her profit, she will borrow some of the company's shares for a fixed period, let's say 10 days. Sell them on the market, and then, in 10 days, she will go back to the market and will buy these shares because she needs to give them back to the organization she borrowed the shares from. If the original price of the shares was $10, this means the investor was able to borrow the shares and sell them for $10 on the market. And then, 10 days later, she finds out she was right and the price per share dropped to $7. She buys the borrowed number of shares on the market and gives it back. That's a profit of $3 per share. On the other hand, if the share price had increased to $12, then this would have resulted in a loss of $2 per share. This type of trading is very similar to regular trading when you buy shares on the market and they are actually yours. However, the outcome is the opposite because the investor bets on a price decrease. Such approach is called taking a short position because in 99% of the cases, market participants using this strategy have a short-term investment horizon. Taking a long position, on the other hand, means that an investor buys a stock and expects the stock price will perform well over a longer period of time. Perfect! The day of the IPO is finally here. This is when it will be labeled as a success or, God forbid, a failure. In general, investment bankers prefer a stable, slightly positive performance in the first few days of trading. The reason for this? Well, if the IPO is sold at a price that turns out to be too high, then this means investors would be disappointed, and many of them could consider abandoning the stock, creating an immediate selling pressure because more and more shares will be available for sale on the market, which will drive down the price even lower. And that's the last thing anybody wants, right? On the other hand, if the stock price skyrockets moments after trading, then that's a testament that investment bankers didn't value the company properly, and founders left a significant amount of money on the table. So, to prevent any of these situations as much as possible, the investment bank responsible for the IPO makes a stabilization effort, which consists of supporting the share price. However, before I explain how stabilization works, it would be better to introduce the concept of overallotment. Think of it this way. A little known secret is that on the day of the IPO, the investment bank sells more shares than it has underwritten, meaning it sells shares it doesn't own. That's right. In this context, underwriting means buying the shares from the listed company to resell them to investors immediately. So, the bank sells the shares it has underwritten to investors, plus an additional quantity of shares. Hence the term over allotment. Of course, this creates a short position for the shares sold but not owned. 
the investment bank will have to go to the market and buy the borrowed shares in order to give them back to the company ownership. And this will be a nice protection against a falling stock price. A willing buyer usually helps balance the market price, absorbing downward selling pressure. At the same time, this position could represent a significant market risk for the investment bank. If the share price rises on the day of the IPO, or a few days afterwards, the investment bank would lose a considerable amount of money, given that it sold the shares at the opening price, but still needs to buy shares on the market to give them back to the company ownership. Buying when the price is high and selling when the price is low isn't the preferred type of business for investment bankers. So, an additional mechanism needs to be put in place in order to do this. In most cases, the issuer grants the investment bank a free call option. We will introduce call options and their respective terminology a bit later on in the course. But for now, please consider the following. A call option gives the investment bank Now's the right time to provide a great example, right? How about one of the biggest IPOs that we've seen in recent years? Facebook. The company, founded by Mark Zuckerberg and a few of his Harvard classmates, resisted takeover attempts for years. Zuckerberg turned down a $75 million acquisition offer in 2006 and a $1 billion offer later in the same year, when Yahoo tried to buy the company. After a few rounds of investments, in 2012, Zuckerberg was finally convinced that the website is ready to go public. One critical question that investors wanted to understand is, how does Facebook make money? Of course, it had a huge user base of almost 900 million people at the time of the IPO filing. But the unknowns were plenty. Is the company going to be able to shift successfully to mobile phones? How is it going to sell ads that will be displayed on mobile phones? Is it going to be able to monetize its huge user base? Of course, it was obvious that Facebook had plenty of upside. Advertisers tend to be attracted to Facebook because of its massive reach, high user engagement, and ability to target ads at specific users based on the information they provide, which is pretty much every advertiser's dream. Facebook's revenues grew at an amazing pace. The average growth of sales between 2006 and 2011 was above 140%. That's precisely what investors are looking for, remember? They want to buy the shares of a company that has an amazing growth potential precisely like this one. What about profitability? With a net income of $700 million and an EBIT margin of 47%, it was pretty obvious that the company is ideally positioned to capitalize on its growing revenues and improve its margins even further. Throughout the roadshow, Facebook's stock valuation increased. In early May, the firm looked for a valuation in the range of $28 to $35 per share. But on May 14th, it decided to go with a higher target, $38 per share. Of course, a company like Facebook isn't IPO'd every day, and demand was high. Some investors were even willing to buy shares at $40. Facebook was a long-awaited IPO. The firm is very famous among retail investors, which is a very encouraging signal. So, when IPO day came on May 14th, Morgan Stanley, who were Facebook's global coordinators for this deal, suggested a price of $38 per share. And this is very, very close to the maximum price suggested in the book building phase. The company was valued at a stratospheric $104 billion as it managed to sell 4.8% of its capital for $5 billion. After the IPO, the company's price went south for a significant amount of time. By the end of May 2012, the stock had lost more than 30%, reaching $25.50 per share. Investors who participated in the IPO 
were, of course, more than unhappy. Some important finance commentators labeled the IPO a fiasco. Fortunately enough, the story doesn't end there. A few months later, the company's solid fundamentals and growth perspectives convinced investors that this is one of the most valuable businesses in the world. In 2018, six years later, the company's stock price trades above $185 per share. So what is the lesson then? Was this a successful IPO? Most definitely, it wasn't. But how come, one could ask? If I had bought one share at the day of the IPO and held it up until now, I would have made 4.5 times my money, which is pretty remarkable in a six-year time span. Yes, that's true, but investors were left with a sour taste after the IPO. And this is something that should never happen. A company wants to keep its investors happy. One of the principles to do that is to apply a slight discount at the day of the IPO. Instead, the company's ownership opted to sell at the highest range they could, which ultimately hurt the stock price for a few months. Of course, over the long run, business fundamentals are more important. But I can also assure you that there are plenty of institutional and retail investors who bought in at $38 per share and sold at $26. A horrible scenario in an IPO. Valuation is a tricky topic, that's true. But market sentiment and book building indications are the perfect tool that allows bankers to suggest the right call to their clients.